I get accused of this a lot. A lot of people will say, well, that's your anti-supernatural bias. You just don't allow for the possibility of real prophecy. And I will argue that it is a methodological necessity to reject the possibility of real prophecy if we want to function as scholars at all. Mm. Because when you say we have to allow for the possibility of real prophecy, there is no circumstance then where you can interrogate or question a claim to real prophecy. Because you, when you say we have to allow for real prophecy, you're saying the normal critical scholarly methodologies and frameworks and lenses, we're going to exempt this story right here. They do not apply. Right. But to say anything is not real prophecy requires the imposition of those very frameworks and lenses and methodologies. And so you pick and choose which story gets to be exempt and which does not. And so if you say, well, you have to allow for the possibility that Isaiah really prophesied about Cyrus, but then you turn around and say, well, no, Joseph Smith obviously didn't predict the coming of the Civil War. <laughs> You're imposing historical critical methodologies on one place, and you're saying, no, this gets to be exempt in the other place. So whether it's the Book of Mormon or the Bhagavad Gita or the Quran or even even the, the failed prophecies, I mean, the people who say, well, this has to be real prophecy make excuses for failed prophecy. And so even the folks who said, yeah, that comet over there, we're going to be riding that thing uh, next week. You, you don't have a way to consistently apply the same approach and wind up at that's real prophecy, that's fake prophecy. Right. So out of methodological necessity, critical scholarship cannot accept uh, real prophecy, uh, at least in my opinion.